Hello and welcome to the Mortgage and Real Estate Podcast by Pinnacle. My name is Chris Giannino. Thanks for joining us today. I am here with Pete Giannino, my brother, as usual. And today we are also joined by Tony Sukenik, a prominent legal advisor to business owners and leaders in greater St. Louis and beyond. Tony, uh, we really appreciate your time today. Um, Tony counsels, he guides closely held enterprises, individuals, companies, and institutions in their formation, in their growth, strategic transition, and acquisition. Uh, He's been a a shareholder at Sandberg and Phoenix in Clayton for the past 23 years after getting his feet wet for 14 years prior, starting in 1987. And Tony... um, is a local boy here. He, he went to SLU University and, uh, for, his, um, for his law degree and then went on to Washington University to excel even further uh, with his master's. Tony, thanks for joining us. Pete, what's going on, yeah. boys? Today we're going to tackle some important topics that are, that are uh, hot in the business world. Yeah, very, very happy to have Tony with us today. Um, he's going to talk to us about some brand new federal legislation known as the Corporate Transparency Act. And <laughs> Tony, just give us a brief rundown of what this is. It's causing a lot of it's causing a lot of energy in the business world. Well we're recording this on Valentine's Day. So, <laughs> uh, it'll be dispersed uh, over and over again past then, but we're gonna break some hearts with uh, <laughs> the discussion of FinCEN. Um, and you know to Lawyers and business people, uh, we're all going to have to learn acronyms that have been around but not part of our vernacular. And one of the very first ones is FinCEN. And what is FinCEN? FinCEN, F-I-N-C-E-N, is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And it was created in 1990 to support federal, state, local, international law enforcement by analyzing the information required by the Bank Secrecy Act. And the Bank Secrecy Act is one of many acts that came around since 1970, but then there was a renewed spirit of multiple acts that came out after 9-11 in 2001. And Mm -hmm. uh, the onus up until uh, FinCEN's creation of the Corporate Transparency Act, the onus had been on uh, the banks and the financial institutions to uh, report uh, suspicious activity in what they called SARS reports, mm-hmm. and and to and they were highly regulated, um, and uh, many of uh, of these banks and financial institutions across the country have uh, been have been required to enforce the United States rules uh, and to deal with transparency, and it's just now the United States is coming into the fold, uh, even though we started this in Europe and we started it across the globe asking for transparency with the financial institutions, um, Canada, United States, Australia, were the last to enact a Corporate Transparency Act. This act came around in 2021. Uh, you know, I don't recall this, but I, I was told that uh, Trump vetoed it. Hmm. And you would think something that Trump vetoed would have gotten some press. Right. Uh, and especially since Democrats and Republicans alike overrode th- that veto. Well, and, and uh, Tony, again, thanks for joining us in here. We're, we're talking about uh, a law that just was passed. And now if you are a corporation, an LLC, um, any entity that filed a document with the Secretary of State to open a business, now you are required, and we'll talk about when you started and when you're supposed to file based on when your business started, but now you're, 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 you're required to file additional information, um, and you better do it, otherwise there's hefty fines. Yeah, and I'm going to, just just before we go on, because Tony mentioned, um, you know, the, the FinCEN and the Bank Secrecy Act and SARS reports. Chris, those are things we've talked about in the mortgage context a lot. So generally, those acronyms and, and those that legislation um, and those agencies uh, are applicable or related to banking. But 
to this this legislation is way beyond banking. Yes, in fact, it's going to impact over 32 million entities across the country. Wow. And as we sit here today, uh, Congress has uh, passed uh, a resolution and you know to defer this one more year. And Senator Scott just introduced to the Senate uh, this week uh, a, a companion bill to introduce uh, a, a delay. Um, but it's not going to go away by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, these 32 million are going to have to register whether it's this year or next year. But right now, as we sit here today, it's this year. And it has to be done by December 31st, 2024. That's for pre-existing entities, for pre-existing. and then any new ones have a reporting requirement basically at the time you form it, right? Within a, Within, a month or so? Well, we have initially when the regulations came out, it was going to be within 30 days, and they gave us a big break. For the first year of it, this experiment, they're going to give you 90 days. Oh, boy. So at its, at its simplest form, and it's on a very complex topic, at its simplest form— I have an LLC and I own um, several investment properties and I own them in an LLC name. Since I registered that LLC name, that would mean that I have to what? That would mean that before, in, unless there's a delay to 2025, but currently under our existing law, before December 31st, 2024, Chris, you would have to register your LLC with the beneficial ownership information, that's BOI. So we're gonna get lots of new acronyms, but you're gonna have, and it's not not new to the banking world, it's new to us. Right. right? It's new to to Chris, Pete, and Tony, but it's to the the folks that deal with this every day at the banks, they've been, they started dealing with this a long time ago. Uh, And you're gonna have to file that information by the end of the year, and the penalty is five hundred dollars a day up to ten thousand dollars and or two years in jail and and this is all regulated under chapter 31 of the federal uh regulations and and one of the notations and now the reason i bring up 31 is that all our tax laws are under 26 and so the cpas of the world are allowed to uh practice to an extent uh, some some law in the sense of discussions of tax laws under uh, certain exceptions that are there uh, because it's under Chapter 26. But as it relates to the Corporate Transparency Act, this is Chapter 31, and there's an absolute distinction. And the enforcement of this law under Chapter 31 has not been delegated to the IRS yet. Very, very interesting because, you know, when we think of, I'm just talking locally in Missouri, when we think of um, registering something to create an entity with the Secretary of State, that process can be accomplished uh, very quickly, very simply. And now, it, you know, with with little ramifications, but you can easily change it. Now we're dealing with these kind of penalties you're talking about and, and federal legislation. It's a whole different ballgame. Pete, in the old days, which was last year, <laughs> ending December 31st, 2023, <laughs> uh, in the old days, client called up and said, I need an LLC. And they would, they said, well, I'll get you the information later. They just gave you the name. And we would file the articles of organization. We'd have the name. And we would know that they wanted it manager managed or member managed. And that's all we had. We put ourselves, our, our entity down as the registered agent, and the lawyer often acted as the organizer of the LLC. Um, and prior to that, when we did, when corporations were more prevalent, uh, we were the incorporator. That happened every day. And then we later clawed and, and begged for that information from our clients, uh, as did our legal assistants who said, I got to open this file and please give me the information. Uh, Yeah, the company's up and running. They're not, this this is out of of sight, out of mind. Right. But now today, this year, we have 90 days to report this to uh, FinCEN. And the the real kicker is starting in 2024, 
not only do the beneficial owners have to report to FinCEN, and we're going to talk about who a beneficial owner is, um, so will the applicant. Yeah. And in, in here's the thing. You know, you know this, is a, this is such a new law. It's hard to say that anyone will be an expert in it until they make a lot of mistakes. I mean, really. That's right. I mean, and, and so I've been reading this and have been dealing with it for the last couple of years because I co-chair for an international group of lawyers and CPAs and investment bankers, uh, governance and corporate compliance for this organization worldwide. So this has been on our radar for a couple of years. But it doesn't mean we're, we're, it just means we've read a lot about it. And when we first read about it, we thought, okay, well, maybe the answer to getting around this applicant, this applicant reporting situation is going to be, we'll just put the client's name as the organizer and then file it. And we thought, well, that shouldn't make us the applicant. Well, the, the regulations on this and the laws are changing on it almost every week. Mm. So on January 12th, uh, FinCEN, in their frequently asked questions and answers, uh, came out and said, oh, no, you could have up to two applicants. Mm. One applicant's going to be the person that pulls the trigger and sends this to the Secretary of State. And the other applicant is going to be the brainchild behind drafting this document. Not, the, not necessarily the person that signed it, but the person that really f completed the information to fulfill this articles of organization and, then, and get it filed. So we're basically looking now at two applicants. And those two applicants have to provide the same kind of information as the BOIs, mm -hmm. the beneficial owners. So let me just d to dumb it down again here. So basically in the past, which is, you know, last year, if you were to start an LLC or if you were to start a business, you would file that under the business name. And then when you file your taxes and, and everything, everything's done under your business name. And that's, that's the information that's provided. Now, moving forward, you start an LLC, you start a corporation, anything that you file through the Secretary of State's office, uh, I'm sorry, through the uh, yeah, Secretary of State's office, then now in addition to the business information, you have to supply personal information of the individuals that are applying and the individuals that are principals in the company that's being started. Absolutely. And, you know, in the past, the government had a lot of this information through their tax returns, but now they, they really want to hone in and make sure they, it's accurate and they want to know where you are. So and, and so, and, and they want to have, uh, they'll want a current address. They're going to want to know, they're going to want a personal ID and they're going to want a picture of that personal ID that you're going to download. And it's either going to be your, your driver's license or your passport or some other ID that they mm -hmm. sometime in the future will allow. So what this is going to do, I mean, and, and people are saying, well, why would they do this? Obviously, I mean, the reason that they are stating that the law is passed is because it's created to prevent tax fraud, money laundering, and um, financing terrorist organizations. That's that's the go-to which they have for many laws that are put into place. So it's, it's what's going to mean is additional time to submit this, um, less privacy when it comes to it, and probably more cost because you're either going to be uh, hiring somebody to do it or you're going to be doing it yourself. And if you do it incorrectly, then you might have a fee or whatnot. But uh, just another layer, um, if you're a business owner, that you have to supply additional information. Is it once or is it yearly and then only when things change? Well, it's, it's once until your address changes. You got 30 days to update it. Or until your passport or driver's license expires, you have 30 days to update it. So you have to update your, your information within 30 days. The information that you deliver, when it expires or it changes, you have an obligation to update it. Yeah, so if you're, if you're a business owner out there, chances are you have several places where you have to update your address change, add this to the list. Yeah, and make sure you're getting, around, getting along with your partner and your business and other shareholders so you don't have to keep changing things. 
That's right. Uh, um, so we talked about, you talked about 32 million entities. <clears throat> Give us some idea of w- who is included in that. Well, Chris was absolutely accurate in stating that it's any entity that files with the Secretary of State. That's the triggering event. If you filed with a Secretary of State, then that's the event. Now, there's some others that are going to be coming around that are not as usual in different states. Uh, for example, co-ops might be formed uh, uh, in a different way, and and ultimately uh, they may they may come into the fold. But but generally, what the rule is is anything that's filed with the Secretary of State, so any kind of entity, and then together with that information, we have to provide all the uh, the DBAs. And of course, once you start providing those DBAs, this is a good time to look back and say, did I file fictitious name registration? And then further, of course, in Missouri, there was a time when you filed your fictitious name registration, it was one and done. And now they put a time limit and the time limit is five years. So it, this is a good opportunity to clean up your governance house. It's a good chance to to, to take a look at your operating agreement. Do you have, sometimes people change members and they don't update the operating agreement. This is a good time to do it. It's a House good cleaning. Yeah, it's a good time to update your operating agreement to even add provisions that require all the members to be compliant with the Corporate Transparency Act. You know, if, if we're gonna be partners, we wanna make sure that you know, our partners are providing that information and they're providing it currently because it's the reporting entity that can be found with the fine as well as the individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And so you want, I understand what you're saying there. So that if you have a, if you have a three member LLC, for instance, if, if, you know, if not everyone's doing their part in terms of reporting or, um, you know, if you present it, hey, you got to sign this, you got to present this information, then you don't want the entity to be on the hook. Um, and, and, you know, so transparency, it's kind of an, Chris, Chris alluded to that a little bit, but that is an interesting word, I think, for legislation. Just, just, just coming right out with it, like saying corporate transparency. So we want to see what's behind the scenes. And, and some entities have been created with shareholders being entities or members being entities themselves. And so, so they, you know, mem- members are actually an LLC. And the, so they dig, they'll dig, right? You got to dig past all those layers. At the end of the day, they want to find a natural person. It's like piercing the corporate veil um, from a government standpoint. That's right. And there's 23 exceptions. And there are three that are most prevalent to us that, that we'll see as common folks. The first exception is if you, in 2023, had a business that had $5 million in sales, more than $5 million in sales, and it's in the conjunctive, and had more than 20 employees. That means you have to have 21 employees, okay? So that's what they define as a large entity, and you're going to have to have that in order to have an exemption. That's annual. So when we were talking about what are our obligations annually, if you are relying on that exemption for 2024, in 2025, you got to look at your sales from the previous year. And ultimately, in the year you sell your business um, or there's a wind down, you're not going to have that exemption. I know there's other exemptions, but for that particular exemption, what would you say the reason for that exemption would be? You know, I didn't read the congressional notes on that. I can only speculate that they thought that uh, entities that have $5 million or more in sales already have enough transparency with the government in some kind of form or regulation. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, car dealerships would easily meet that $5 million in sales. And, of course, they are so reg- – you know, they're registered with, uh, you know, Missouri Highway Patrol just to give, to give out licenses. They're already yeah, heavily yeah. regulated. Right. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So exception number two. So exception, and let me back up on okay. exception one. My, my commentary would be, you know, I didn't make this up. It's in all the FinCEN information. They're saying that this is to get the Russian oligarchs and, and to get money laundering. But the reality of it is, is that most of those institutions, I, would, I could only speculate, are large enough to 
have that exemption and have more than five million in business and more than twenty employees, they they might be missing the target, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, yes. So <laughs> I, I'm I'm not sure where it came from, uh, but th- that's it for the conversation on that exemption. Okay. So the second exemption is anything that is a 501c. Now, you know, we don't unless you're really in the practice of nonprofit law, you don't think about well, what are the 501c's. But in nonprofit speak, 501Cs are 501C1, 2, 3. 3 is the one that you get your tax write-off for. 4 is like, uh, you know, often for lobbying. 5 and 6 are like for bar associations and civic associations. So there's, there's it goes. There's so you're series. nonprofits. Yes. But anything that's a 501C. And what's really interesting is it seemed that. And we're going to talk about the opportunity to uh, respond to uh, uh, proposed rulemaking. It seemed like some folks weren't paying attention to the proposed rulemaking when this was coming out. And some of those folks would be owners associations, homeowners associations. Hmm. So homeowners associations before 1973 – if they even took the time to register, if, they, if first of all, if they took the time to incorporate, then they could make a decision whether or not they wanted to be a 501c4 or 501c7. But most of them probably didn't go so far to get a, a letter of determination. In 1973, Congress enacted Code Section 528, which is for owners associations homeowners associations, condos, okay, any that are incorporated. And so that's specific. It's a specific tax code for owners associations under 528. This, the, the regulations under the Corporate Transparency Act says 501C. It implies, it talks about exempt entities. Even though 528 owners associations are somewhat exempt it doesn't include them Hmm. and we've gone so far as meeting with congressmen uh we've met with congressman luke defelt and and asked him uh can you get it included do you understand that there's a large percentage of this world this country that is in homeowners associations and they have a hard time being compliant just with their annual reports if they're incorporated, mm-hmm. and and he was very receptive to it, but the feedback we got back from Washington was, if we give owners associations an exemption, other people are going to want an exemption. So let me just say back to you what I think you said. So you're saying that owners associations that are uh, created under 528 are not included in the exemption of 501. See. Exactly, and so so if you take that a step farther, um, those homeowner generally, the way it's written right now, homeowners associations are subject to the transparency requirements. Absolutely, and those those board members will have to register. Wow! And we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, they a lot would of be resignations a B- coming. They would be a BOI. <laughs> well, not only that, but these these people are usually working out of the uh, you know. Out of just the well-being of the neighborhood, the, yep. they're not making uh, money on this or anything. But right. um, maybe it's a common way to launder money that we're not aware of. Right. <laughs> um, so well, I, I always said the way to tell. I mean, the, the associations, most of them have a hard time just keeping the lights on. A hundred percent. Well, we deal with them all the time. Yeah. To get documentation on time right. in a timely manner is right. challenging because you're usually dealing with somebody who has to do it between soccer practice and work. Right. Right. The trustees aren't available generally. So I asked our Office of Legal Ethics Council, um, what's our obligation to inform our clients of this new law? And the response we got back was, if they're an active client, we have an obligation to inform our clients. So for the lawyers out there, we have a lot to do this year and and to get this information out. Yeah. And for the people that aren't clients of yours, I mean, like all law, the burden... Uh, falls on the individual it's it's not whether you knew uh what if the law existed or not it's whether you comply or not that's right you know there's a and going back to the exemptions there's a third exemption and that's if it's an inactive entity 
And the inactive entity has five prongs to it. And one of those prongs is that you have not had any, you, you, you haven't had any activity uh, with the account uh, during the pre preceding 12 months. There hasn't been any uh, ownership change in the preceding 12 months. You haven't received funds greater than $1,000. You haven't active, actively acted in business. Uh, you're not owned by a foreign person. You've been in existence for more than a year. And then the real kicker, that you don't own any assets. Hmm. So there's a lot of inactive companies that might hold on to one asset. Right. You know, they couldn't get rid of it. And, and they, could, they could have even filed their dissolutions of organization or corporation and still have the obligation to file under the Corporate Transparency Act because they still have one asset yeah, that, or more. And that comes back to what we talked about at the beginning about the ease of which entities can be formed. And so there was, you know, it's, there's many, there are many entities out there which have been formed, but which may have owned something and still own it, but don't perform any activity. So you're not off the hook, evidently. No. no. So you, I know, so we kind of addressed um, who, who we're talking about, and, you know, in terms of the entities. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into, I think the beneficial owner is a good time to address that. So who, who, who is reporting? What are we reporting about? We know the entities, but what are the individuals? Well, the, the people that are reporting are people that own 25% or more in the LLC. And then there's a complex set of rules that include rights of first refusal and puts and calls and options and things of that nature. So, um, you know, there are a lot of investment companies that as part of their mantra when they buy into uh, uh, or invest into an LLC that they have these options. So, you know, the console's going to be you have to over-report. I mean, you're, it's not going to be unusual for someone with 15% ownership to, re, to report under the BOI requirements, uh, even though the threshold is 25%. It, because you have to, there has to be an examination of the operating agreement or the articles of incorporation and the buy-sells and, and the bylaws that are associated with it if it's a corporation to, to determine whether or not truly the beneficial ownership is uh, 25% or not. And then the real kicker is going to be, a after you're done doing that analysis, and that's where us as lawyers are going to have an opportunity to make a living uh, having this discussion with our clients, as well as the opportunity to amend their operating agreements. But the real kicker is going to be um, there's a definition of BOI, beneficial ownership interest, uh, that includes control. That goes back to the conversation we just had on owners associations where the board members would have to file. And in the frequently asked questions and answers from FinCEN, they come right out and say, it's the CEO, it's the CFO, and it's the general counsel if, uh, for sure. But I think it's, but it says anyone that has control. So if it's a manager member LLC, it's going to be the manager more than likely. If it, you know, why wouldn't you include the board of directors uh, to the extent that they have control? And there's there's really uh, there's no safe harbor that's been given yet. So again, you're going to overreport on the ownership side. You're going to overreport on the control side. It just it seems like yeah. I mean, I guess you know tax revenue. Uh, but the amount of resources that are put, they're going to be put into this to cross reference everything to see who actually owns the property or, or the business and what percentage they own, you know, takes a tremendous amount of resources as well to, uh, to, to try and scrutinize companies to get additional tax money. I mean, that's probably, uh, it's really what it boils down to. I would, I would presume. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very interesting. And then, you know, we are in an election year. I mean, I don't know. It, it is probably not the top of, uh, priority, but you know, uh, I mean, once it's enacted the law, which it is already, I mean, for it to change would, uh, well, we've seen a lot of change already and, 
like like Tony referenced, I mean, it's amazing that the law has been in effect for less than two months, and, and we've already seen changes to the language in it. That That's right, and it's coming out every day. Um, and there'll be new regulations as as people are executing it, like you said. So I, I mentioned how we, we were schooled on January 12th on what an applicant is. Right. And, you know, what, what generated that was the reporting companies. A reporting company is like a, is a company that might serve as a registered agent. You know, they get paid to do that, and they, they, be, get, they might be paid for other corporate services. So the reporting companies wrote FinCEN a, a legal memorandum and suggested that they didn't think that they were an applicant if all they did was file the uh, application for the the articles of organization and that's when FinCEN came out on January 12th and said no no if you pull the trigger and you register with the secretary of state if you're the person that does that you're going to be considered an applicant and the burdens of this applicant being an applicant is that we as applicant we have to provide this information to our clients and the easiest way for us to do that is to get a FinCEN ID number. So I now, I, I got one for myself, and I put it right underneath my name on my email because I don't want to be accused by my clients of not having furnished that information. And, and so there's two things I'm doing. I have on my emails my FinCEN ID right after my name, right before, the, not before a phone number. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and I, uh, I also have on all my invoices three lines that talk about this act and that you can go to jail or you can be fined and you should act us <laughs> you should ask us about this act because right. yeah. uh, I'm, I'm you know we're going to send out uh, more notifications and white papers and simple executive summaries and we'll inundate our clients several times uh, and we've gotten a lot of response from the clients that are asking, well, well what is this? Right. Well, what do why, I have to why, do? Why, why do you pollute my invoices with right. these three lines every month? Right. And, well, on the, on the BOI, the beneficial, or the, yeah, the beneficial ownership information, what is the information? Is it just what's your name, your date of birth, your social security number, your address, or the yes, basics? It, it's those things, and, and, uh, and they, they want to see... Uh, a, a current uh, identification, a picture identification. So presumably if your driver's license expires, that's considered a change, I, su I yes. assume? Yeah, and you have to update it. So I, my driver's license expires in June, so I put my passport that expires in three years. So I've, I've, I'm going to have to... Yeah. Mm. And, and as an applicant, I have to keep it current. I think, and then I think, about, right. I think about business docketing calendaring these events and you know recognizing different changes sometimes people earn let me say that better sometimes um employees earn um ownership interests and it exceeds 25 percent at some point and there's another change it, you could think of a whole myriad of of reasons for a reporting so to assist us with uh helping our clients register with FinCEN and to keep track of expiring dates and to send emails to invite to their follow their follow the the uh, their fellow members uh, to to be compliant and for someone to keep track of it, we have uh, uh, talked to a number of report companies and we have landed on using the FinCEN report company. Uh, it's an independent company has nothing to do with FinCEN. They will do the reporting with FinCEN. They, at the current time, they have a, a variety of fees, but if effectively they'll charge $199 a year um, to maintain this registration. And we have a platform that we're going to share with them, our, you know, as, as a law firm and as lawyers, where we can kind of keep track of our clients' activities. If our clients choose to use the FinCEN report company to register with FinCEN, their other option is to find another report company or to do it themselves. But to do it themselves, you know, Pete, here in our office, we have someone that helps us keep track of our bar registrations and to make sure that somebody did it, okay? Yeah. Do you think individuals are going to be able to, to do this, especially if they have multiple companies or multiple members to keep track of, uh, of their expiring information? I mean, it, it's... Uh, 
to to be on the cheap side of this could cost a lot of money. It's dangerous, and and you know not to get too into the weeds with the legal consequences, but I think about lawyers and the like. Um, the distinction about who is the client then, you know, and that's why I like, I like what you're proposing because you, you know, your firm is going to be representing a lot of entities. And so these are some individual reporting requirements. I mean, they're, I guess it's a requirement of the company, but they're in, it's about the individuals and, and the individuals could face consequences. So, you know, it's good to have a reporting company involved. And, and you know, for us, the best practice would be to update our engagement letters, send an amendment out and saying, you know, we're not going to be responsible for your registration, uh, but you need to you need to be aware. You need to re- register. Um, we have vetted a vendor, the FinCEN Report Company, and you can use that vendor, or you can choose another one, or you can do it yourself. And um, I think that's the best practice in how you deal with that. That's a lot of work, especially if you have a lot of clients. Yeah. So for like a yearly for a yearly cost of that, I mean, basically. Yearly, they're making sure you're still compliant. If you're not, they, they would notify you, hey, your passport is outdated, or did you move? Because if you did, I uh, see you moved here, but you didn't update this yet. They'll notify you, and then you'll confirm it, and then that FinCEN company will update it through the system, or, you the, know. They will send you a reminder that you need to get the information. And right. I think that comes yeah. back to Tony's um, earlier comment about perhaps amending your shareholder agreement or your operating agreement to reflect a commitment on the part of the shareholders and members to comply with the Transparency Act. So, of course, a reporting company is not going to necessarily know if you moved from, you know, Baldwin to Manchester or whatever. And they're they're not going to tell you who the BOI is. Exactly. The lawyers are going to have to do that. And so so while while there is an opportunity to use... um, the report Finson reporting company or, or a similar entity, which sounds like a great uh, suggestion that doesn't, that's not the end of the analysis because maybe your operating agreement needs amending. And like Tony said, there's going to be a lot of housekeeping that's going to necessarily result from this obligation. Pete, I, I bet you've had the same experience where clients have come to you and they give you the operating agreement and you look at the secretary of state and the operating agreement says it's managed by the members. And the Articles of Organization says that it's manager managed or vice versa. Yep. This is an opportunity to do a double check, to clean those up. And how many clients come to you with an LLC and they don't realize that an LLC can be a disregarded entity, it can be taxed as a partnership, it can be taxed as an S corporation or it could be taxed as a C corporation. And if they chose anything other than a partnership, they're oftentimes their operating agreements don't have the language that dovetails with their choice of entity. So the choice of entity goes a step beyond just your choice of an LLC. It's the choice of the taxation of that entity. Yeah, a fresh look is is really important and you know that, that's really not the point of this analysis because this this legislation by itself is so important but frankly it seems like every time we meet with clients and they get a fresh look at all their uh, business documents and organizational documents there's going to be there, there of course there's a cost to that work but there's going to be an opportunity to improve how you operate or maybe even save money so pete i want to bring up a couple other things um you know Uh, You chair the real estate section for the Metropolitan Bar Association for BAMSL. And, uh, uh, you know, this this is going to go right to the heart of real estate. So there's something called an ANPR, ANPRM, ANPRM, Advanced Notice of Proposed uh, proposed Rulemaking. And uh, that was done on February 7th. And the NPRM, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, will come out Friday the 16th. And that's going to uh, encumber, essentially, uh, all residential real estate for this Corporate Transparency Act. So while the frequently asked questions are being updated daily uh, by FinCEN, there are more regulations coming out to affect 
and to broaden uh, the, the scope of the Corporate Transparency Act. And the intent of the one for residential real estate is ultimately going to uh, sweep to catch, uh, they, they refer to it as a cascading method. And they're going to go through a cascading method of tiers of in, in these proposed rules. So this is, this is a picture of what we got, and it comes out on Friday. And then people have 60 days to respond to it. And then sometime in the future, th there'll be a, a proclamation that will require uh, cash real estate transactions uh, to, to be uh, 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 reported. Uh, and it may include all real estate transactions. Right now, we're talking residential. Um, but there are some questions in the proposed rulemaking that uh, cross-reference uh, commercial, but their, their first focus is residential, and what they're looking for is who closed the deal. And if there isn't a title company doing it, they're gonna, if it was done in a law office, they're going to want the lawyer. And ultimately, in this cascade, they're going to want whoever prepared the deed. So, and there's going to be a reliance on if, if I know there is an upper tier entity that is going to report it like a title company, even though I prepared the deed, I'm off the hook as the lawyer. But I'm going to have to be aware of that. Right. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of nuances. This has just come out. It will affect residential real estate transactions. Um, and I was just at lunch with a, um, a, a, title company uh, officer, and he said, you know, today, as many as 30% of the residential real estate transactions are cash. Yep. Now, I, I was just thinking that as you said that, and, and, you know, we see it from the mortgage side, of course, because, you know, with rates rising and, and inventory low, the cash transactions have certainly picked up, and uh, that's going to, th those are certainly, I'm wondering how title insurance companies, you know, are going to deal with this. Well, they, they've been dealing with it. Okay. And they've been dealing with it just like the banks have been dealing with it. Um, really, what what's going to, where it's going to catch people, two things. Currently, under the Corporate Transparency Act, there's no mention of trusts because they don't get registered with the Secretary of State. But they will, in, this will um, sweep and in, include trusts reporting and they're going to want to know if it's revocable or irrevocable. They're going to want to know who the beneficiaries are. All that kind of information, the federal ID number, all that kind of information, is that's what they're asking for in these proposed regs. And, um, you know, that's what's out there for real estate right now, residential real estate. And look for it on the 16th of February and thereafter. Um, and then look for, ultimately, some rules on it. So when you, just to give some people an opportunity that, that have some um, contributions here. When you say something's coming out on, on Friday and then there's, a, I think you said, a 60-day uh, report, 60-day uh, comment period, is that for people to, entity, uh, businesses and stuff, to give their two cents about whether the rules should be changed or how the regs should be written? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then um, just on Tuesday, uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network moved Tuesday to expand federal anti-money laundering to hedge fund managers, private equity firms, and so-called investment advisors. Now, you know, they're saying right now they're not going to include uh, state-registered investment advisors. But, again, you know, they're going to go through the same process, the comment, and, and who knows what will come out, um, as they say, what the sausage will be made. Wow. Uh, so... Uh, you know, we have this is a this is uh, not going to go away. It is moving in lightning speed, and it requires people to be vigilant uh, to this web, to the FinCEN website to see what the current proclamations are. And not only the, you know all this we've been talking about is at the federal level, but the state of New York adopted a corporate transparency act, and that information is going to be public. The information that FinCEN's getting, the regs are not out there yet to discuss who's going to get it as far as other governmental entities or the sharing of it with financial institutions. Um, but at a state level, 
New York's the first to have a Corporate Transparency Act. And that information will be public, and I would expect that states that have government philosophies like New York are going to mirror that act uh, once they see how it's implemented. Uh, and then ultimately, you know how that goes. It, before it's all over, most of the states will have some kind of form of their own Transparency Act. Wow. You know, there, there are... There are many important reasons to fo- what we're talking about is a little it's a little scary it sounds like burdensome but you know it's not to take away of course there are many important reasons to form entities whether it's liability protection tax consequences some kind of uniformity etc so those things still need to be considered strongly and it, there's always been legislation that has that has caused chaos and um, you know and and a lot of um, uncertainty and that's probably what we have here for a short time but just like anything else just yet people have to be diligent they can't ignore it there are consequences you know it sounds like you're you you and your firm are you know leading the charge to really um provide an opportunity for clients to address this and like you said there's going to be mistakes along the way but people really need to be cognizant of this we won't be experts until we made all the mistakes <laughs> Yeah, a lot like uh, the real estate laws. I mean, it, it, you, it's hard to get uh, black and white. This, this is a little bit more black and white, of course, but like you said, a lot of changes on the way. You got homeowners associations that are um, not exempt, but you have non-for-profit organizations that are exempt, and they're basically non-for-profit organizations. So it's, it's confusing, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's where uh, attorneys come in to help, um, you know, build the case one way or the other yeah um do you have any other any other thoughts uh, either of you guys that you want to bring to the table or about this or um otherwise people can reach out if they have any questions yeah I, i'm really grateful to tony um for his time today and and certainly his you know the time he's taken up to this point to get to even present what we have and and uh, encourage people to reach out with any questions that they have along the way. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thanks for doing this podcast. Yes. Thanks very much. So today we heard from Tony Sukenik, attorney at Sandberg and Phoenix in Clayton. He talked about the Corporate Transparency Act and some other real estate laws that are coming down the pipe. So please reach out if you have any questions about this episode. Uh, for Pete Giannino, I am Chris Giannino with the Pinnacle Loans, simply the best in home loans. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.